I never like watching myself on film because usually it's like you get a lot of feedback and it's not, you know, the best feedback all the time. It's like, hey, you made a great play, but you know, you need to work on this, isn't that? So I really never watched myself play very often. And watching that just gave me an incredible sense of pride, but also watching it, it gave me this sense of like, man, that was an incredible team that we were on. And it was all a derivative of the coaching that we received. I never thought of us as an underdog, but everyone else thought of us as an underdog. I mean, we right. kind of had this attitude that we're supposed to win. I mean, that's what we do. But that was Mr. Basu. He was a guy who yelled, but he didn't yell at the same time. He talked to you and matu- helped you mature to become a man. I had an incredible dad in my life, but it was like I had an incredible uncle slash father with him. He knew my whole family. He, I mean, my brother played for him. And I met him when I was very, very young. I mean, I was probably in the sixth, seventh grade, maybe younger than that, probably. And he just gave you the sense of, like, he is the guy. You know, the thing is, when you're in school, I graduated in 1982, fortunate enough to play on two state championship teams. And you don't really realize it when you're a kid that you're being coached by a legend. You know that he's a great guy, you th- take it for granted. You think that all great high school coaches are just like Coach Basu, right? Humble, quiet, kind as can be religious, he treated us all so well. The biggest thing he did for me was he instilled uh, confidence. I was primarily a defensive back and he wanted to move me to wide receiver and I didn't think I had the hands for it. And when he said something to you, uh, the fact he had confidence in you, I felt like I had confidence in myself. And it worked out well for me and and for the team. So, uh, you know, he obviously knew what he was doing. So in uh, 1979, Latin closed and I was a student there. And they didn't give us much time. I think they told us in May. So we all had to scramble and find new schools to go to, my whole, my whole class. Came very close to going to university school, shadowed at Benedict and shadowed at uh, university, shadowed at St. Joe's. And Benedictine just popped out at me. People may or may not want to hear this, but Latin and Benedictine were very similar as far as diversity and the, the way the schools were. So I felt a lot more comfortable here. I've told my wife and anyone that would listen to me that it was the best decision I ever made was coming here. I'll never admit it to those Latin guys, but uh, we would have never won it without them. <laughs> You know, some of the people that transferred in, we already knew. And it just really enhanced the brotherhood. There was really no rivalry. It was, it was an, actually an incredible assimilation, integration, teamwork. I don't, I don't even recall, you know, coach, I don't think coach expected anything less. It didn't matter what, what jerseys we were wearing the year before, we came together as a team. And I think uh, that definitely contributed to our success. Yeah, if you're going to talk to Ricky King, but forget everything I said, tell tell Ricky that um, we would have been much better off without him. <laughs> and uh, that, that we, we carried him along you know, through his senior year. Uh, we were playing um, Youngstown Cardinal Mooney uh, that, that week, and he, he put a new play in, and it was called a, a slot right banana right. He said, King, I want you to go out act like you're going to block the cornerback and we're going to act like we're running around your side when he approaches you run past him and we'll throw the ball so i was not doing it the way he wanted so he moves me out of the way and he runs the pattern himself (laughs) it was it was comical and he literally stopped which i was not doing he was stopping for the defensive back to come up on you but he showed me how to run the pattern. We ended up scoring two touchdowns that week off of that same play, one to the right side, one to the left side. We're playing Youngstown Cardinal Mooney and the ball was thrown a little wobbly and a little, and was, it, it was snowing and everything. And the Youngstown Cardinal Mooney came over to, t- you know, to intercept the ball. And what he did was he tipped it, he tipped it to, to the, my backhand. And I caught it and ran 50 yards for a touchdown. 
So fast forward 15, probably 15 years, I'm getting some dental work done. I have all the tubes and stuff in my mouth and a dentist comes in I'd never seen before. It wasn't my normal dentist. Looks at my chart and he said, uh, oh, Rick King. He goes, where'd you go to school? And I said, Benedictine. And he said, well, what year did you graduate? And I said, uh, 1982. He goes, well, I graduated from Youngstown Cardinal Mooney in 1982. And he goes, uh, did you play football? And I said, yeah, yeah, I sure did play football. I go, did you? He said, yeah, yeah. You, we had a good game between our two teams. So then he said, what position did you play? And I said, I was a wide receiver. What position did you play? And he says, I was a defensive back. And he goes, you won't be getting any Novocaine today. <laughs> After our senior year when we won the championship, there was a handful of us, I can't remember, it was like George Askew and Gary Grossell and maybe Jim Lasher and a few others. We thought it would be a good idea to give the Spirit Award to um, Joe Gall. I don't know if you remember Joe, uh, but uh, he, was, uh, he was basically, the only reason I played is because Joe ended up having a uh, a seizure, maybe a sophomore, junior year, and he had a brain tumor. He was always on the sideline, but you know, having a tougher time getting around. And so, I don't know how I got nominated, but I went to Coach Fasu and I said, hey, we would, we think he should be the Spirit Award winner. And Augie looked at me with his like, big eyes, like, where'd you come up with that idea? <laughs> and uh, he goes, you know, we have some other thoughts, uh, you know, in regards to that. I'm like, sort of dismissed me. I'm like, oh man, that, was, that wasn't that nice. <laughs> and then uh, at the award ceremony that night, they ended up presenting Joe with like a special award and brought him up. And so I was like, oh, you know, now I sort of get it. And then they announced the Spirit Award winner, which was pretty funny. Uh, and it was me. <laughs> and I was like, huh. <laughs> That's why I didn't say, <laughs> what a great idea. <laughs> he already had his ideas. Um, so I don't know, you know when he formulated all those thoughts, but um, it was something that sort of showed me. You know, one, you don't have to show all your cards when you're doing stuff, um, but he listened, right? But he never even let you know he was listening. Uh, and then he reacted. It's almost like a quiet leader. He did all these things sort of behind the scenes, which, you know, that's why he was so amazing. You know, I think many of us who look back uh, appreciate it as we get older and, and raise our own families. When I think of Coach Basu coaching and teaching all those years and doing everything that we do in our own careers, raising a family, you know, the, the, the work-life balance of, you know, managing a job, managing a career, um, spending time with your family. He obviously did that. I didn't think much about that when I was in high school, but it's really awe-inspiring, you know, as I look at what, what he accomplished with eight children, uh, the coaching career, the lives he touched, you know, both in his family and so many student athletes. He just did things for other people. He did nothing for himself. I think if he had his choice, he would not have wanted to be in the baseball and the football hall of fame. He probably didn't like that attention. He, you know, he drove a car that was probably 15 years old and let us put our stinky uh, shoes in the back of the car. It didn't bother him and he was probably happy to do it. Hey, Mr. Basu was the greatest coach I've ever played for. It's the simplest answer I could share with anybody. He impacted my life just by loving his team. I mean, he <laughs> I mean, he would he just loved us all, and you know, it. You, he let us play ball. He gave us opportunity to play. He formed us into a team which is possibly the greatest thing you could ever ask to participate in. I mean, it, it is, I, you, you know, we watch sports all the time and you see dysfunction and, and, you know, again, we had dysfunction, trust me. We all didn't agree on every sentence that was ever delivered to us. But when we walked on the field, we had this thing where we were just always, we, we appreciated one another's skills. I was like, I wonder, what, you know, when someone scored, I mean, we, we all ran to the field. If somebody made a play, we all ran to one another defensively and we congratulated each other's each other and our successes. And that was just, that was Basu. I mean, it wasn't an individual. I mean, we had some great individuals, but 
he made us a collective unit, which you know is a very hard thing to do. Just being a a a guy who twiddled around with coaching, it's the hardest thing to do in the world is to bring a bunch of people together that don't know each other and say, okay, y'all are a team. And make it work, y'all, by the way. So he was very good at that. And it wasn't that he was mean to us. He was in charge. We knew he was in charge. And he had a bunch of supportive coaches and he surrounded himself with dudes that knew what the hell he was doing. And I think that's the smartest thing you could ever do as a coach or a leader is to find the best. And he could identify who those guys and girls were and brought them into his program. And uh, it made us all the better for it.